Good evening for the seventh time. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters, Roseville area, I welcome those of you present and those of you participating remotely to artificial intelligence, empowering our communities. Just a quick reminder, if you haven't already done so, if you could silence your phones, that would be appreciated. My name is Rita Mills, and I'm standing in this evening for Rachel Geyser, our League of Women, local League of Women Voters president. We first of all, want to thank Ramsey County Public Library for hosting this event, along with Do Good Roseville, co-sponsoring and assisting us in getting the word out. We remind participants at each event that the League of Women Voters is a nonprofit volunteer organization that encourages informed voting and participation in government. While the League does not endorse or support political parties or candidates, its mission is to grow, empower, and protect the vote. In addition, the lead does advocate on certain issues that it has well researched. Incidentally, our Roseville Area League represents the communities of Elkin Heights, Lauderdale, Little Canada, Maplewood, and Roseville. We have members from a number of other communities as well. And any person who is 16 years of age or older can join and we always encourage and welcome you to do so. And the membership bar will be open most of the evening, as will be uh, voter services. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that we gather on the traditional lands of the Dakota people and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded throughout generations, including the Ojibwe and other indigenous nations. And now I would like to introduce our program organizer, Carrie Dixon. Carrie leads a very, very busy life. She's been a member of the League of, our local League of Women Voters for almost tw uh, 10 years. She holds a doctorate in nursing practice from MSU Mankato and teaches in the nursing program at Normandale Community, Community College. Carrie lives in the city of Maplewood and the Roseville School District with her husband and three teenage boys. That explains a lot. So I turn this over now to Carrie Dixon. Thank you so much, Rita. And it's so lovely to see everybody here who's joining us uh, in the room. I'm so happy to have several attendees on Zoom as well. Welcome. Um, I've been very excited for quite a long time to hear from our speakers tonight. So um, I'm just gonna give some introductions and then we'll get to the stuff. Um, our objectives tonight is to really help us all get a deeper understanding of AI's capabilities and its uses in our community. Um, our hope is that we will all leave here um, better informed and um, able to contribute meaningfully to discussions on AI and its role in our community. Um, we all know that AI is a little bit scary. Um, it's pretty relatively new, at least in um, some of the uses that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, and there are potentials for misuse. I think we could probably do an entire session just on the downsides or the risks or the misuses. But our focus tonight is really on the positive uses and the ways that it's being used in our community. We won't shy away from the negatives as well. So I am going to get us started with just a brief overview introduction just to make sure that we're all on the same page with what AI is and what generative AI is. And then I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker, Kathleen Coate. She's gonna talk about revolution, revolutionizing education 
how AI enhances learning and empowers students. Following Kathleen uh, will be Marcus Kubicek, a robot program director of Monarch Healthcare Management. He will talk about AI and human services, improving care and enriching lives. Our final speaker will be Bill Ed from uh, Election Security Manager from the Minnesota Secretary of State's office. And he will talk about ensuring trust and security, AI and elections. We have saved some time at the end for questions and answers. And I anticipate a pretty robust session. That's what I hope for anyway. Um, for those of, us, those of you present in the room, you will get some note cards you can jot your questions down. And at the end of our, after our final speaker, um, Carol will be collecting those questions and will be reading those questions for us. Um, those of you that are on Zoom, at the end, we will ask you to enter your questions on chat and we will start our Q&A session from there. All right, so we're gonna talk about what is AI. I'm gonna give you some examples of AI. We'll talk about generative AI and how that is different or what are we talking about there? And then some applications of that. So some definitions of artificial intelligence. Um, this is just uh, straight from the um, Encyclopedia Britannica. It says the ability of a digital computer or computer controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. Pretty general, pretty broad, right? Um, it's always helpful to know how our policymakers define something, right? So this is from the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Act of 2020. That definition says it's a machine-based system that can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. Artificial intelligence systems use machine and human-based inputs to perceive real and virtual environments, abstract such perceptions into models through analysis in an automated manner, and use model inter inference to formulate options for information or action. A little more specific, pretty wordy, right? <laughs> so I want what I want everyone to realize is that we are all using AI. We are all interacting with AI um, every day, whether we know it or not. So examples of that um, are things like recommendations on, say, Netflix, when it tells you based on these programs that you've watched, here are the programs we recommend for you. Or based on these books that you've read, here are the books that we recommend for you. Things like um, face recognition to open a cell phone or auto tagging of photos. Um, writing editors that we use in um, academia. So things like Grammarly or plagiarism detectors and um, citation generators all use artificial intelligence. If you've ever spoken with or, or interacted with a um, customer service through a chat bot, those are artificial intelligence that, that basically scan for or look for a word or a string of words and respond um, to that based on an algorithm. Virtual assistants, things like Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa, um, fraud detection systems, to text, speech recognition systems, um, and things like PowerPoint Designer, which help me sort of put together the designs of the slides are all um, artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is the big broad umbrella. And generative AI is one type of artificial intelligence. And this is what's gotten, I think, a lot of the buzz over the last year or so. Um, it's not new, nor is artificial intelligence, but what's happened over the last year is it's become pretty robust and pretty amazing, right? And so when you hear about things like 
chat GPT um, and image generators, what they're talking about there is generative AI. So generative AI is a subset of artificial intelligence techniques that focus on creating new content, data or outputs that have a degree of originality, often resembling human created content. Unlike traditional AI systems that are designed to follow predefined rules or patterns, generative AI has the ability to generate novel and creative outputs. Now that definition came to me from that DPT using the prompt definition of generative AI. Of course, it was on me to know that that was accurate, right? is another definition. This comes from um, IBM Research Blog. It says uh, deep learning models that can generate high quality text images and other content based on the data they were trained on. I like that as a, a nice efficient, and it reminds us that it's really about how these are trained, right? What's gonna come out depends on what goes in. So numerous applications of generative AI, and again, I started with a um, prompt on chat GPT to help me with this. So things like art and design can generate art, visual art and graphic design. It can compose music. Um, we certainly have text generation and you've seen some examples already tonight. Um, image and video uh, generation, so image synthesis, video game design, um, multiple, many, many uses. And again, these are just a smidgen of what is going on out there. Lots of uses in healthcare for medical imaging analysis. Uh, it can be used for simulation and training. You'll get a little bit um, about that, some of that going on tonight. And language translation and enhancement. Um, Incidentally, I have to tell you all that when I got here and I updated Zoom on this computer, a um, new feature came up and it is called AI Companion. I don't know if you can see that right there, but that is brand new now in Zoom and it just came up tonight. I thought that was pretty good timing. So as you can see, these things are being integrated into a lot of the tools that we already use. All right, are you ready? Okay, well, I have the absolute pleasure of introducing our first speaker to you all. Um, her name is Kathleen Cote. Kathleen currently serves as an instructional designer and technologist at Normandale Community College. She holds a master's degree in theater directing and a bachelor's degree in interpersonal communication. Since 1999, she has taught classes and directed productions at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, Iowa Western Community College, Illinois Central College, and at Normandale. Having transitioned to a full-time instructional designer, Kathleen is now a core member of the Center for Teaching and Learning, which designs faculty development opportunities and works with IT services to provide the most effective support for technology in teaching and learning. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Is it okay if I hide this little window? A little bit hiding, still kind of there. Okay, so this is an image. It's an example of generative AI. It was created with a tool called DALI, which is a um, branch of the OpenAI, same company that runs ChatGPT. Um, and this was the prompt that I used. A peaceful beach scene with a college instructor relaxing while grading papers on a computer in the style of Vincent van Gogh. And it took about, it took about five seconds for it to come up with this image. Um, now, Vincent van Gogh is no longer alive. If he were, he may be a little un, uh, a little angry and we're stealing his style, um, and that's another issue. But I kind of like it. You know, it, it took me a while to get to this prompt. I have a thing called prompt engineering or 
prompt hacking, sometimes people call it, where you put in a prompt and you don't get exactly what you want. You might say teacher sitting on a beach and it gives you something that's kind of ugly and you don't really like it. So you try new things and you try, you know, I like to Van Gogh. Let me see if it'll do that. Oh, you really want the teacher to be working on the computer. So these are the kinds of things that you can do with generative AI. So I use this image in multiple places. Um, you'll also notice the little pixely thing at the very lower right corner, the little multicolored. So it didn't quite finish image for some reason. I see that a lot. I don't know why it does that. What I'm going to talk a little bit about is how generative AI might empower teachers and how it might empower students. And I really can't talk about this without talking about some of the negatives as well. So I apologize for that, but we'll be part of this because we have to be careful with certain things. But um, one example is syllabus creation, ideation. If you, any of you teachers in here, you, you're up late on a weekend thinking, oh, I have this class on Monday, I have no idea what to do. You kind of have a block in your head. Um, you know the subject well, you've studied it, but you just need some fresh ideas. Generative AI can be really, really great for that. You can ask it to give you ideas for assignment types, grading scales, um, things that you can put in your syllabus for the entire semester. How should I grade students in a sophomore level intro to chemistry class? What are the types of things I should grade them on and what should the percentage breakdown be? These are the kinds of things you can ask generative AI. Um, course policies, clear expectations, how to write it. Again, and I work with a lot of teachers who are not strong writers. Maybe they're, that's not their field um, and they're really good at other things, but writing is just not what they do well. And they want to write a really good policy or they want to write a really well-crafted introduction for themselves or for their class. So these kinds of tools can be really helpful for them. Style and tone. Carrie gave me this idea. She said, you know, I, I'm a good writer, but I'm a very technical kind of writer. I want to write a syllabus policy or a statement that is more warm and friendly and inviting to students. So she took her own text that she'd already written, put it into the generative AI and asked it, prompted it to write it more warmly for her and spit it back out in a different tone and style. So it was still using her content, it was doing it in a different way. So these are all ideas that can empower people who work with students. <laughs> Similarly, lesson planning, kind of what I was saying before, content, ideas, give me some ideas for some acting exercises, I might say, because there's hundreds and millions and I forget. And there's probably some that I haven't thought of or known before. And so it's scouring the internet as it has done, it's been trained to do ever since the internet started and it's gonna spit out ideas for me. And as a subject matter expert, hopefully I can figure out which ones are the best. Grading rubrics. A lot of our faculty struggle with this too. They wanna to be able to give students substantive feedback that has clear explanations of why they got the grade that they did. And again, if they're not strong writers, this can be really challenging for faculty. So asking, um, asking the tool to do that for them. And assessment tools, this is a little bit more of a fuzzy area, but can you use generative AI to grade for you? I get this question a lot from faculty. I just put all my papers in it and tell it can grade them for me. I'm like, well, technically, yeah, you could. Um, so this is still in the works. Um, there are certain tools that have been doing this for a while where they can look at students' work and they can actually give student instant feedback as to how well they're doing with the writing. Grammarly was one example, but there's some more sophisticated ones as well. I have a feeling that a lot of the textbook publishers, which is a huge industry, um, are scrambling. They are scrambling right now to get latest and greatest assessment tools because they know that faculty are gonna want them. Whether they're good or not is still out to, <laughs> to be judged, but that is definitely what they're looking at. So here's some examples get a little more specific. I, I might just move this out of the way if possible to hide it. Let's do that too. Um, okay, so you could say to chat GPT or other types of tools, create a 30 point rubric for a persuasive speech at the graduate school level. So you can be really specific. What are you looking for? What type of thing? What is the grade level that you're looking for? And it will spit it out. It'll probably take about 10 seconds. Yes. 
select four famous movie scenes to show examples of smash cut editing techniques. Carrie mentioned I have a master's degree in theater and so I teach television and cinema. Um, this was, and these are all things that I've done, that I've tried with the tools. It, it does, it takes about five or 10 seconds. It gives me four famous scenes. I can ask it to do it again, give me more, give me more, give me more detail. I could go on and on and on with something, almost like a back and forth conversation with the tool to get me what I need for the student. And then I could take those scenes to class and say, here's some great examples. And my students might be thinking, how did you know all of these? And they might be movies I've never heard of or never seen before. And so, you know, we're only, we're, I'm just one person. I can't see every movie ever made. So the tool, however, knows a lot more than that. This is a fun one. List four scenes from Shakespeare's Richard III would be suitable for high school students. This is a similar prompt to something my husband just did. He teaches theater in a high school and he needed to cut a play, a big play down to small scenes because the students didn't have time to do the whole play. And so he's like, I don't know what scenes to pick. So he asked the tool. He said, I still needed to use my own judgment and my own expertise to know whether that would work for my students. It saved him so much time. Richard III is a very long play, if you've never seen it. <laughs> um, now, whether it's suitable for high school students, that's an interesting judgment call, right? I don't have any idea what criteria the tool is using to make this judgment call. So I'm going to have to use my own expertise for that. So you can see where I'm going with the level of thinking that's still needed for this. I have some examples of this in my next slide of slides. Create a slideshow presentation of the life and times of Philo Farnsworth. Sorry, that's cut off. Philo Farnsworth is considered the father of television, the inventor, the main inventor of television. He was the first one to have a patent on the television technology. So if I knew I had to go into class and talk about Philo Farnsworth, I might say this. I might say, a slideshow presentation. I need a PowerPoint or whatever. Um, I want to have some pictures. I want to have some text. I want to have some background. And so I'm just going to show you two slides that it gave me out of the 10 or so that it gave me on the next thing here. So the first slide it gave me, it's not very interesting. It's just a black slide with white text. But, and this is the tool called Tome, it gave me six categories, introduction, early life, the invention of television, challenges and controversies, legacy, and conclusion. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a pretty great lecture format. It makes sense that I would follow that kind of format in my lecture. Now, I'll pick out one of the slides. So this is the second to last slide that it gave me, legacy slide. So there's the title in the upper left. And <laughs> look at that text. It's really super tiny. But obviously, I would not use this in a classroom. I would have to spiff it up and make it better. But um, as an expert in the subject, I would read that slide and I would say, is this accurate? My first question, and I really wonder what sources it used. I have no idea. There is no way to know. One for one thing, these tools a lot of times they don't they aren't transparent in where they're getting their information. They're scouring the internet. That's what they're telling you. It could be it could be sites that aren't reputable. It could be the New York Times. It could be Reddit. It could be Instagram. We don't know. So I did look at this pretty closely, and it's. Yeah, I mean, it's got some things that are true, but it also talks about how, I'll just read this little bit of the second paragraph because I know it's really small. Farnsworth's achievements were widely recognized during his lifetime. Is that really true? In my history, in my understanding and doing research, a long study of the history of television, that really wasn't true. He died regretting inventing television. I will let you know that. He, would, he forbid his family from saying the word in his house when he was older. And there's a long story behind that. So uh, that's not really reflected here, right? So there's a lot of nuance that we're missing, but you know, it's a good start. It's a good start, it's a place for me to build off of. Also, I have no idea where, how it came up with that picture. That looks nothing like him. I don't know what is represented there. It looks kind of like a brewery meets a laundromat or something. I don't really know what's going on, but it just came up with what it thinks maybe looks like something an inventor might stand in front of and that might be what an inventor looks like, but it really doesn't pertain to anything. So it was kind of funny. But it got, you know, it got me started. So let's talk about students a little bit. This is also a DALI image generated by the tool DALI. 
prompt was a college student working in a library in the style of Minecraft with lots of colors and a picture window looking out over a courtyard. And this is what it gave me. That was kind of cute. It actually gave me about four different options and I picked one I liked best and I just put it in here. So you may have heard the term guide on the side. This is a long time term that we've used in education. The counterpoint to this is sage on the stage. The old fashioned way of teaching, you know, starting in medieval times might be someone in a, a big robe with a hat, um, in a cold, damp, dark, castle-like looking uh, college um, standing and giving their information to students. That's a sage on the stage. Education has obviously evolved a lot since then, and now sometimes we consider ourselves guides on the side. We are there to facilitate learning rather than just giving learning to students. We want them to do it themselves. We have all these tools now, research, libraries, and internet, you know, there's lots of different ways. So students see these tools and they say, ah, it's a guide on the side for me. I can look things up. I can ask ChatGPT to do things for me or tell me things. Um, but they still need guidance. As you saw in my previous examples, there's still a lot of expertise and, and high order thinking that needs to be done with these tools. Terms and conditions of the tools. These are internet tools that you use on a computer that you do other things on, like email and personal things. And if you really take the time to read some of these terms and conditions, they say, you can use this tool, but we're gonna read all of your email and we're gonna have access to everything you do on the internet. So we need to help students understand this and understand how to be careful with how they're using the tools. And all of us need to do that too. Um, what it can do is create opportunities for comparing AI content to instruct the curated resources. The perfect example is that legacy slide I mentioned with all of that information about Farlow Farnsworth. Okay, thank you. Um, how are the students going to make sure that that stuff is true? Now, I know it's true, or I, I understand, I can read it, and I can, because I'm a subject expert, but students aren't. So how are we helping them learn how to compare the tools to what's really true? So that's, that's something that we see as an opportunity. Up and coming, AI tools with more transparency of the training data. So this is what we hope is coming in the future, more protection for students more tools that are actually trained on sources that make sense for that discipline. Um, so here's one of my favorite quotes by Albus Dumbledore. There's a character written by JK Rowling. Never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. We like to make sure students do that. I think that's my, I got one more slide really quick. Um, I have one minute left, I think. Okay, this is my last slide. You may have heard of Bloom's Taxonomy. It's a tool that instructors use to build ways in which students learn, the progression that students have to go through to learn. Bottom three layers here, remembering, understanding, and applying, these are things that AI can do really, really well. Top three sections, creating, evaluating, and analyzing, it's gonna have more trouble, at least for now. So we really want students to get to that upper level. Sure, they can use the tools, but they need to know how to create, evaluate, and analyze challenge with education, especially at the community college level, is that lower three are where we spend a lot of time with students. In the introductory type courses, foundational knowledge, how can we help make sure students, if they are going to be using these tools for those things, which is really easy to do, that they're doing it correctly and responsibly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Marcus Kubicek. Marcus is employed at Monarch Healthcare Management, which owns and operates skilled nursing facilities throughout the state of Minnesota. As Monarch's robot program director, he is tasked with understanding the novelties of AI robotics and fostering this relationship within the communities he serves. His undergraduate degree is in psychology, he obtained his master's in social work at UMD in 2021. Currently, he is focusing on large-scale project management, while also in pursuit of his licensed independent clinical social work, LICSW. Welcome, Marcus. Well, can everybody hear me? Perfect. We've got 15 minutes, so let's cruise. Um, 
Welcome to the Monarch Robot Program. So um, we have introduced humanoid robots effective July 6th of last year into eight of our locations across the state of Minnesota, one of which uh, being the estates at Roseville in Roseville, Minnesota here. So um, the purpose of this program is a collaboration with the University of Minnesota Duluth, specifically with a woman named Dr. Arshia Khan. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight, so I'm in her place. And she, um, the university owns all the IT behind the project, and we are just collaborating with the university. So as you can see on the right-hand side here, we have a Pepper robot. Pepper comes in at about four and a half feet tall, and the university is using AI to work with the robot and engage with residents in just a playful and social format. So right now, this robot can dance, it can sing, it can tell a couple of jokes. It loves to laugh at its own jokes, even no matter how corny they are, for the programming of AI. We also have a little robot called Neo that's in our community. And that one is designed to just be an elder-friendly yoga instructor. Think of like your range of motion exercises and just doing that uh, with residents in like 10-minute sessions. The purpose of this program and how we want to see it work is in when um, a resident is getting ready to go for bingo. So we have an activity at 2.30 p.m. and we have a 15 minute window where our residents are um, get, uh, making their way into the room and uh, gathering. We can use a robot during those time frames to actually sit down with the residents and tell those jokes, maybe do a little stretching, maybe dance, sing, um, journey one too many times to have people just have a good time. So. That's what I've been kind of doing for the last year and a half within um, humanoid robots. This isn't the traditional generative AI in which you were talking about. It's a step back from that. It's more of the hardware and how can we take this robot and teach it to maybe go 10 feet down the hallway, to turn around and do a look back using this robot to how we can help the resident eventually be like, oh, it's 12, 15, it's Sunday. All right, um, 2 p.m., we have bingo, let's go do that. Are you interested? Would you like to go or would you not like to go? It's all about being able to alleviate a little bit of stress for our members who are calling bingo, performing the exercises, running down the hallway to get to the next resident and make sure that they've been offered the activity, the engagement. And it's also for some of our residents, um, ironically enough, who might be a little bit introverted. One of the very first interactions I actually had with one of my residents was, oh, there's a robot? I don't have to talk to humans anymore? That's great. And I immediately was like, what? No, 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 no. That's not what this program is here for. But I'm also quite extroverted, so I have to understand the other side of the spectrum. So when we work with our residents, when we work with our communities um, all throughout the state, we take opinions, we take ideas, and we see how we can collaborate with the university as well as our community to see what kind of AI they want. What, what, is the, what is the generation above me want? How can I serve them? How can robots serve them in a positive platform? So that's what we've been kind of doing on a large scale. Um, and that's just in the humanoid sector. Going forward a little bit, we also have um, housekeeping robot. This robot on the side is called a CC1 Voodoo. Um, does anybody here have a Roomba? Show of hands, perfect. So everybody knows how the room is great. Everybody knows how the room is a little frustrating. This is an industrial grade Roomba. So the purpose of this type of machine is to be able to go up and down floors and just clean them, such as the very library that we're in, a sand club, Walmart, all over the place, it's a hotel industry. It's no different in healthcare. You're gonna start seeing machines pop up like this, um, not only at Monarch. I know um, Ekiman has one of their own over in Detroit Lake. I know other states, um, nursing homes all throughout the country are starting to deploy this type of technology. The purpose here is to be able to take a step back and look at this form of AI to be able to do a simple task every single day. Um, I know we're supposed to keep a positive light on it, but like something like this, one of the major concerns is job displacement at points. Mm -hmm. I can tell you as somebody who works in healthcare um, in the long-term care industry, machine up there is not taking somebody's 40 hour work week. That machine up there is dropping somebody's 45 hour work week to a 40 hour work week. We spend so much time cleaning and like doing uh, these massive deep infections. So that anybody, anytime somebody leaves the community, leaves the room, 
we have to do a deep clean. Anytime we get a new MN, healthcare, protection precautions, any of that, that machine is designed to just alleviate that bit of stress down the common hallway so that in the Minnesota winter, the foot traffic sounds so bad with the salt on the wall everywhere. So that's what we've been doing with that. We've been um, utilizing this type of AI with the intentions to alleviate a little bit of stress throughout the communities. And you'll start seeing it pop up more and more. I know there's a company in the area called Gerard Business Solution down in Burnsville, Minnesota. They have this robot in their store and they're selling it to customers everywhere. Not a sales pitch, but sharing what's in your backyard. Um, it's all over the place. You're gonna start seeing this kind of technology pop up. And then to kind of wrap up the conversation, we can sit here for a little bit because there's actually two things. Um, anybody ever been in virtual reality? Okay, a couple of hands are popping up, love that. So there are virtual reality platforms that are starting to hop up in um, long-term care as well as healthcare in general. And the consumer side of, you wanna go skydiving? Let's go skydiving this Saturday. We can put on our headset and jump out of the plane together or to um, actually the clinical education. And um, just to kind of speak light to that a little bit, um, I can get really nerdy here because it's pretty cool. So UBSIM is a platform out there that is designed to do clinical education in headsets. So the value behind that is just not wasting PPE. Like that's a big one. I'm the eco-friendly there. But what we've been doing is beginning to develop the state nursing competencies in virtual reality so that we can start educating team members that when we make an edit med error, instead of just doing the traditional write-up of, oh, there's a med error, go about your day, you can actually correct the error in virtual reality. You can recreate the problem using the form of AI and come back to the individual and be like, hey, we know you're having a rough day. We know, we know John Doe and John Snow have very similar names, but we made a med error. Let's go back and look at how we can do this properly. It's just another form to go back to your point of like the educational platform. What can we do to empower people to be more successful in their job duties throughout the day? So that's with the UBSIM platform. And we're just coming up to the point where we are looking at um, introducing our first two education within uh, UBSIM. Another really cool thing that's connected to AI, and you'll start seeing this, is you can remove that language barrier. Um, you can very quickly use generative AI to translate educations over, uh, translate educations over so that should somebody be speaking um, Spanish and like I can speak Spanish, I can still use AI to provide that education. I can go ahead and save that platform so that anybody who has Spanish as their native tongue and English as a second language will get a better understanding of their education. So that's one of the really cool things about AI going through the future is being able to remove that language barrier, being able to step back and truly get to the root of the education, regardless of where we're at in life and how we get there. On the other side of all this, um, you can see at the top, a woman that is actually, I believe in that moment, she was petting a dolphin. <laughs> so um, Red Endeavor, it's another virtual reality platform starting to come up with more and more technology with our residents. Um, it's a great way to have people who traditionally spend a lot of time in one building get out into the world. It's not the traditional way of what you would do. It's not being on a flight and traveling, but it's hanging out with your friends in the communities and being able to do live sessions, do um, exercise and start biking and popping balloons on the process to go pet the buffalo down in Patagonia who hang out with the penguins in Antarctica. These are all ways that guys are impacting um, quite literally your uh, neighborhood. About a mile away from here, the estate of Roseville, and we have both these programs up and running in this location. And we have people coming in and out of, from the community all the time, checking out the project. They love it. Some people don't like it, and that's okay. Not everybody wants a big mask over their head. Not everybody wants to be interacting with a robot. But as the rest of the world continues to step into AI. It's something that we need to do in long-term care as well. Any questions? Otherwise, I can keep rambling about random stuff. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Marcus. That is obviously a topic that is um, especially of interest to me as a nursing instructor, especially where we're talking about um, some of the clinical training capabilities that are out there. So I am um, uh, excited to introduce to you all our final speaker. Uh, his name is Bill Eckblad, and he is a native of South Minneapolis, a proud U of M grad, and a retired Navy captain. As a Navy cryptologist, he served all over the world with his final assignment at the National Security Agency in Maryland. Upon retirement from the Navy in 2019, Bill returned home here to Minnesota, to join the team of Secretary of State Steve Simon, becoming the office's first election security navigator. The office's navigator program works with county, local elections, and IT officials to raise awareness of security threats to elections and highlights available resources through federal, state, academic, and nonprofit partners to lower risks. Bill and his wife, Sylvia, have three teenage children and reside in Egan. Thank you, Carrie, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here tonight, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for putting this great event on tonight. Uh, so I want to begin with an apology. I think I missed an email about part about focusing on the positives. So there, there may be a little bit of doom and gloom to my remarks, but please bear with me. I hope by the end you'll see that it doesn't necessarily end that way. So let's call that sort of the initial caveat. So I want to begin uh, a little bit. Uh, here's sort of the obligatory agenda slide. We won't spend a lot of time on that, but um, a quick overview of the things we'll cover here in the next few moments. I wanted to talk a little bit though about how this topic of artificial intelligence in elections sort of fits into the context of elections over the past few cycles here in Minnesota, but really in the country at large. So many of you know, have been involved with elections maybe for quite a while. For a long time, it was pretty steady state. The elections got conducted according to rules and statutes and laws. There were headlines from the results of the elections as there should be, who won, who lost, there was a runoff. If you had things that impacted election day, like weather or a power outage or something like that, generally things flowed as they were supposed to without a lot of outward or uh, external factors. Until around 2016, when things started to get a little more interesting. Some of you may recall that in 2016, uh, we learned later that there were foreign adversaries that discovered uh, that there may be vulnerabilities in some of our systems that they could exploit try to have an impact upon how our elections are created. And cybersecurity type situations we're talking about there. Uh, focus specifically on our elections technology. Sorry, not quite on camera, okay. Uh, and in addition to those focused efforts from cyber adversaries, people started to realize that elections technology was just technology and was subject to some of the same sorts of uh, concerns from a security perspective that all uh, technology can be. Things like ransomware and and other types of, uh, of bad things are, can happen to election systems as well. So there's a lot of focus after 2016 on cybersecurity for elections. That's really where our program at the Secretary of State's office got started. And that sort of um, remained on the agenda into the 28, uh, I'm sorry, 2018 election season, and really in the run up to 2020, until a little thing called COVID happened. Some of you may have remembered that. Uh, that also, again, became a major factor in how elections had to be conducted. Something totally different, conducting an election during a global, global pandemic meant a lot of different types of considerations, again, for how the elections conducted, uh, not steady state as it had been for so long prior to that. Uh, after 2020, we continued to have some things happening in election world. Some of you uh, may have heard of January 6th and what happened there. Uh, this notion of mis- and disinformation getting introduced to um, the conduct of elections, election officials, whether the process can be trusted, people questioning, uh, all of that uh, discussion entering into how we conduct them. Again, external factors contributing to the sense of chaos in elections that we've all had to contend with. Um, and then the other uh, storyline that sort of emerged in the run-up to 2022, although thankfully didn't become a huge factor, was sort of this notion of physical threats to election workers, poll workers, election officials, facilities where elections are conducted, where ballots are counted. This notion of physical security as a concern for elections also entered the stage. So the point here is that, um, and you can't see it because of that little chat box, I apologize, and I don't know if I can move it. Um, um, we've been expecting disruptions in elections for the last several cycles. So when we talk about what 
uh, artificial intelligence may mean for the 2024 election cycle, it's just the next thing. And there will be a thing after that. We have to pile on all the things and keep dealing with them. Elections will get conducted and we'll deal through it. So there's a little positive note, if you will. <laughs> One of the main aspects that you'll hear a lot about in terms of AI and elections is how AI may influence process of political campaigns. Now, this isn't directly in the concern lane of the functions of the Secretary of State's office, but clearly related to elections. Uh, we talked about the notion of mis- and disinformation coming out of the 2020 election. Uh, the potential for this AI technology to supercharge the generation of that type of material is something we're, we're watching closely and concerned with. So in the past, you had to have a human sit down and think about ways to inject mis- or disinformation into an election process. We can now turn to some of the neat capabilities you've seen uh, displayed earlier, have those um, storylines generated for us using this uh, artificial intelligence technology. That's new. And that is something that we'll have to contend with. Um, the other thing that that brings to bear, the quality of that material, sometimes much better and can be generated, say, maybe a foreign adversary that doesn't have that mastery of English that a native speaker does, as well as the quantity of that information. So these types of products, if you will, can be churned out at a very fast rate uh, and, and injected into social media or other communications mediums, to try to generate an impact at a scale that maybe we haven't seen before. So the production of the material, not necessarily new, quantity, quality, scale, that may be the difference uh, as we approach next year's election. The other aspect that comes into play with regards to campaigning is micro-targeting. And this is where we may be able to see uh, individuals apply this technology, specifically focusing messages on very narrow segments of the population who may be most subject to being influenced by the message. This would primarily be something we might expect in the social media realms, where it's relatively easy, easy to find people that have a certain perspective or persuasion based upon the types of things they look at or groups they subscribe to, and focus messages specifically on those individuals to try to sway their opinion or their vote one way or another. So that's another new aspect of how artificial intelligence may find its way into the election uh, campaign and election events next year. Um, and I'm really kind of sad that I can't get that box to go away. Is there any way to move that? Because the all the highlights are in the red text at the bottom. Oh, okay. oh wonderful. Hey, I don't know where to put it, but how's that? that? So yeah, um, I stole a quote here. Talk about fortuitous timing. As I was building this presentation last week, the cover story on The Economist was AI in elections. You can't write that, right? So, uh, But there's a quote there that I, I would ask you to take a look at because the key takeaway from their piece was that this guy may not necessarily be falling AI finds its way into political campaigns. And, and the crux of their message, and I'd encourage you if you're, if you're losing sleep about this to go find it, is that we as humans and, and Americans particularly tend to not be swayed so much by political propaganda. It's out there everywhere. We're inundated with it. We're kind of used to seeing it and recognizing it and processing it. We don't tend to fall for it all that much. Studies suggest it's a very narrow margin in the middle that can be swayed one way or another. So there's a little bit of reason for hope. That while we will likely see more of these things, we ought to not lose a whole lot of sleep over the fact that these things are going to determine the outcome of election. Why am I not moving forward? Oh, I see. I'm still on the, there we go. Let's try this. Okay. So another key aspect that we watch closely is whether or not this technology may have the potential, I'm trying to move that, there we go, We're, that's probably okay. Whether this technology may have the potential to influence or affect how we conduct or dare say disrupt um, election itself. And so after the campaigning is over, uh, an election has to be conducted. And I know a lot of you maybe from the league are familiar with some of the mechanics behind conducting an election. Um, people and processes involved in conducting election are not immune to being the subjects of mis and disinformation. Uh, you could have a, a deep fake, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. Uh, well, I'll talk about them right now. Deep fakes are uh, the images and messages that we heard earlier can be generated using AI to make someone appear to be saying they did something they didn't say or um, doing something they didn't do, and using those to try to influence people's opinion about an individual or a process uh, or a statement, whatever might be useful for a particular agenda. So um, a deep fake could be applied to 
um, senior elections official at the state level or at a local county level, have them say something they didn't say. And that would be extremely disruptive to the conduct of an election on election day or in the immediate run up to an election day. So that's an example of how this technology, again, uh, could find its way and having an impact. Now, um, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the things we can do to kind of counter that, but it's something that we certainly watch because elections, they're fluid events. They, they, they happen, we know things will go wrong on election day, election officials plan for that, put steps in place to react, adjust and, and, and complete the election uh, with those adjustments as required. Um, I highlight one example here. Some of you may be familiar. We had kind of maybe the most significant hiccup in 2022 was a, a case at the uh, city of Chisago or Chisago City. Uh, for some very legitimate reasons, there were lines forming. Um, took a little bit longer for people to get through than the county and the local officials had anticipated. There started to be some chatter on social media about frustration. It was raining. It was kind of cold that day or outside. Uh, and and if, if you can envision a case in which that sort of um, message or that uh, unhappiness got picked up by right tool and was amplified and, and, and maybe additional stories like it were fabricated and injected into it, you can envision a case where something that's completely explainable and really a normal occurrence on election day could be portrayed as something bigger, potentially uh, conspiratorial or, 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 or have that flavor to it. And those are the types of things where, again, this type of technology could be leveraged recognize when something is happening, even if it's legitimately explainable, and take advantage of it and turn it into something it's not. Uh, and so you'll see the quote there from, uh, from this uh, professor at Ohio State University. Key to that is being able to recognize it. We know that these events, when they happen, the normal things that happen are, are prime subjects to be taken advantage of for mis and disinformation. So being able to recognize them, quickly counter the messages, explain what's actually happening from trusted sources, uh, is, a, is a key part of, of fighting back on that disinformation concern. Okay, so another way that we anticipate that there could be an impact from artificial intelligence on elections uh, is in a, sort of a broader technological sense. And so uh, the cybersecurity community is watching closely how artificial intelligence can be used to generate malicious software. So using the same tools, tools we saw displayed earlier, you can ask them, say, to generate a malicious exploit against Windows 11, and it'll spit something out. It might not work, might have flaws that would prevent it from actually being used. If you're a bad guy that wants to write that type of software, you now have a starting place. It's like the other uh, examples of using this technology to, to generate a starting point for your effort. So uh, again, this is not unique to elections technology. This is a risk for all the technology we use. Um, I think the, the the bright spot on this one is that that same technology is used and really owned and controlled by the good guys. And so when you talk about the massive computing power required to really take advantage of this technology, um, the same companies that have built it have an interest in protecting their infrastructure, all that, equipment, whether it's Google or Microsoft or Hewlett Packard, all the big computing companies are focused on this problem and leveraging that same technology um, to try to counter the negative potential uses of it from a cybersecurity perspective. So there's another reason there to be a little bit hopeful. And finally, uh, people often ask me, what keeps you up at night with all of this artificial intelligence stuff? And really, it's that blank space. What, what are we not thinking about here? Um, we can only sort of analyze the problem through the lens of what we know and what we've learned and what we understand. Uh, but there is a lot more out there. And I think it's fitting, uh, you know, the day after 9-11, which was really kind of a highlight example of how sort of a creativity and imagination by someone that doesn't view the world your same way can be used to cause great harm. So that's sort of the fear about this technology is what aspect of its potential employment, in our case in the elections world, have we not even had the ability to consider yet that could rear its head and cause real problems? And we don't know if, if you knew it, the question wouldn't be legit, right? So, so the key is how do you deal with that? Well, there are some technologies in development to try to recognize things like deep fakes, uh, technological you know, analysis tools to look at the video clips themselves and determine if they're real or if they've been altered. Some technology to try to label legitimate video and sound clips with a watermark type thing that would let people realize it's, it's legitimate. Those things are coming still early development and, and not the answer yet. 
Um, so we've kind of fallen back on what we've done to deal with all sorts of security related concerns in the election lane. And that is to really focus on tying the elections community together, making sure they know that they're not facing any of these concerns alone. We are, we are a collaborative bunch network. We, we share what we see. We share thoughts and concerns and fears in real time on election day using communications tools we have. Uh, and then being able to formulate a response to whatever that concern is leverages all the resources that we have available to us. At the state level, we're able to reach out uh, to federal, academic, nonprofit partners that have greater insight into various aspects than we do. We can quickly leverage those capabilities to answer those concerns. Um, but again, uh, the, the final word I would say is for individual voters, concerned citizens, um, trusted sources, turn to where you know you can get the truth on elections processes, elections technology, senior elections officials at the local and state level have that information. We need to get the word out that they, they are the ones to be trusted. So I'll part with the final quote there from Chuck Hagel when he was Secretary of Defense, prepare for everything, just that. That's all we have to do, then we'll be just fine. So thank you. Wow, right? We just got a very broad uh, uh, taste of what is going on out there in our community. Just want to point out um, that on the slides, uh, and those are uh, available for download, um, there are a few of the resources that were mentioned in one of the slides, and then um, there is a bibliography. So many of those, like the Economist article and some other things that were used to put this together, those are all on a slide for you. So. Um, I, pre uh, oops, sorry, let's go back. There we go. Um, so they, they told us a lot in their prepared topics, but I imagine that you guys would like to know more and they are here to share more of their knowledge with us. So if you have questions, please um, write them on the card. Carol's going to pick those up. I'm going to start us out that way. Um, those of you who are on Zoom, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will... Um, goes to Carol. While she is doing that and working through the questions, um, just a reminder that you can download the slide that we showed tonight um, from the League of Women Voters Roseville area website. You can point your camera at the QR code and that'll get you there. Um, or if you'd like to give me your email address before we leave tonight and I will be happy to send that to you. I also want to mention many of you um, came here to the Roseville Library for a wonderful class on actually using AI and using chat GPT. And I heard wonderful, wonderful things about that class. Um, so we want everybody to know that that next, that same class is going to be at the uh, Shoreview uh, branch of the Roseville County Library. And that's coming up November 27th. So you can find some more information on the Roseville, um, on the Ramsey County Library website about that. Whenever, Carol, whenever you are ready, I'm going to turn it over to you and um, head with the question. Thank you. Question uh, number one, and I'll paraphrase some of these a little bit so we can get a broad answer. What will be the impact of AI on newspapers or media? Will it make newspapers or media obsolete, more popular? Yeah. So that's just a little bit out of the elections lane, but I think uh, clearly um, things political involve uh, and close to the press. Um, I think it comes back to some of what we heard earlier about sort of um, curated information and, and things that can be um, validated as having legitimacy. And we're still going to require people to do that work. Uh, as we heard in, uh, in, in one of the earlier presentations, there's no um, even suggestion that what you learn from AI, auto, these, these generative AI capabilities, is accurate or truthful. The, uh, the user, the reader, has to try to make that determination. So uh, in so much as we require uh, journalists today to bring us information that we trust, um, I believe we will still have a dependency upon that function to validate what we learn from whatever source, from people that we trust who, who have first-hand knowledge. I'll just add that very recently, um, APA and MLA 
the organizations for citations um, came out with new guidance on how to cite if you do use AI. Um, I've heard in, in the early on in, with the onset of ChatGPT, some news programmers would talk about it. And then at the end of the broadcast, they would say, none of this was created by artificial intelligence. So you might actually see the opposite disclaimers on things. Um, but there is citation guidance out there if you do end up using the tool so that you can at least let the readers know where you've got it from. If you would, if you would stay here, this sure. question is for you, I can tell. Um, why don't generative AI programs show citations mm -hmm. now? I mean, it seems that it would be effortless to do it. Why don't they? Because nobody's making them do it. <laughs> That's the short answer. That's the short answer. Um, ChatGPT scoured hundreds of internet websites since the invention of the internet. And that's basically all they'll, they'll tell us. So, and, and there's no regulation. I will let you know that if you're following the news in Europe, there's the Digital Services Act, DSA, they're trying to pass, or they just passed actually last week, I think, that requires um, lots of different things. But one thing is it's really easy for the readers to tag things that they think are wrong. Um, but there's also supposed to be a lot more transparency for how the AI tools are trained. A sort of related question. Are there discussions to increase penalties for those who create or disseminate fake campaign materials? But there was uh, some legislation passed last summer by uh, here in Minnesota for exactly that reason, sort of uh, place some, some statutory limits on what is acceptable with regards to that type of material. So. Um, I don't know what the federal or trend in other states is, but certainly this is becoming an issue that uh, legislators are aware of and focused on. And I think we'll continue to see an evolution of regulations that sort of seek to control it for especially those types of purposes. There's a question for the robots. Are any people afraid, any of your clients afraid of the robots? That's been almost every day of my life. So I guess my question to the audience would be, would you be afraid of the robot? I see some yeses. I see some noes. You get the entire spectrum of what some of these opinions and feelings are going to be about a robot. And at the end of the day, if somebody's afraid of the robot, we take the robot out of the room. We take the robot out of the activity. We go back to our traditional means. But I have noticed with a couple of people, as you continue to talk more and more about the robots and ask the question and tell somebody that it's not rosy from the depths and it's not going to do everything and then some, that you place the clear limitations on it, it really reduces that fear and that it's just going to dance for five minutes. It's going to do an exercise with, feel free to participate. A lot of that uh, fear is rooted in like stigma of sci-fi, like through education and just reducing stigma. I've yet to run into somebody who's truly afraid of the robot, but only some question, questions behind it. I have a, a couple of questions related to schools and universities. First of all, are any schools or universities banning use of AI? And secondly, as a follow-up, if they're not banning it, are they teaching students how to evaluate AI? Um, it became apparent very early on that banning it is not possible. It's just not possible. It, and part of the reason it's not possible is because what we've said about regulations, there's no regulations, no government entities coming down to Microsoft, for example, and saying, don't use AI in Microsoft Word. And so Microsoft Word actually has AI tools now. So if you were to say to a student, don't use AI, they can't turn around and not use it. So it's kind of everywhere, it's ubiquitous now, and so it's kind of impossible. So depending on how strict technology restrictions are at schools, for example, my son is in high school and he has a Chromebook that was issued to him by his high school. And he and I were talking about this today and I said, um, have your teachers talked to you about AI? And he says, yeah, they say not to use it. That doesn't mean that students won't, but I, he said, well, can't teachers just ask the student for their browsing history? <laughs> I'm like, maybe in the high school level, maybe if you know for sure exactly what computer the student used and you have control over it, but at the college level, the university level, we have no control over that. So that's 
short answer for that. Um, so we we have worked very hard in, in a lot of the teaching and learning circles that we look at around the world, really. The, rule, the word on the street is teach your students how to use it responsibly. That's really all we can do and what we need to do. We absolutely need to do it. And students want to learn how to use it responsibly. They know in the work world, they're going to have to. So why not start now? So I hope that answered that question. This is a very different question from the ones we've had so far. So maybe any of you can, can jump in. Um, there's now a lot of family history information on the internet. How can one tell if it's accurate? Or maybe are you aware of some ways that AI has helped or hindered the study of family history? Do any, any, any of our speakers? Okay. That's a really intriguing question. Um, again, it comes down to what sources are is the tool using. I would think that something like if there were a tool out there, and again, these are up and coming tools, but if there were a tool out there that you know for sure it's using Ancestry.com and tr the trusted Ancestry and family history type of websites, if you know that that's where the sources are that were used to build that AI tool, then I think it would be really interesting to use. Um, and you could ask it, tell me a story about my grandfather or tell me a story about my family. That, that's kind of a cool idea, actually. But again, you have to know the sources that it used to be able to do that. This is sort of a hypothetical. Um, what do you think would make for good legislative restrictions um, to guard against misuse of AI? You could say in an academic setting, or you could say in the public setting, or you could say in the media setting. I mean, if you if you could, if you could make laws yourself, what would what would you do? This is my call as a social worker, first and foremost. Um, I, I I very simply think there needs to be an ethics committee. I think um, you have to create a diverse candidate of people from all backgrounds to be able to come up and have the legislative process like any single industry under the sun is gonna have AI impacted in their own way. And speaking strictly from long-term care, not even all of healthcare, you can represent only so much and what you want and what to be practiced. I think if you could create like this, this truly inclusive group of people to come and maybe get to the, per the point where you can propose a bill, then let it go to legislation and just like build it out from there. But like, it's all hands on deck for this one. That was, that was what I'd have to say about it. I think we need to be careful not to demonize the technology, but consider its uses. And, and, and if there are malicious uses for the technology, then perhaps the, uh, the individuals responsible for those uses uh, should be the subject of control of litigation. Um, but I think what came through in all three presentations is there are positive purposes for this technology. And so over-regulating it um, at the potential expense of economic benefits, academic benefits, improvement in our quality of life is a risk. And so um, I would advocate that we focus on the, the actions and not the tools in terms of what, uh, what we seek to control. Um, the marriage between social media platforms and AI that you had mentioned, um, would, it's so easy for people to put misinformation onto Twitter, for example, and use AI tools to do that or train AI tools to do that. The consequences have to be dire for these companies like Twitter. And this is something the Digital Services Act in Europe is doing. They're making it super easy for users of Twitter to say, this is bad, take this down. So it's really super clear when they're in the platform, they see something that they think is harmful, they report it. And the company like Twitter has a certain very limited time they have to take it down. And if they don't, they are fined, and this is in the DSA, they're fined 6% of their global income uh, if they can't take it down. So we need to bring that to this country. <laughs> I, think this is, I think this is an election question. Um, I'm not sure how AI fits into this question, but this is about the Georgia elections. 
Okay, it's in the news. Where what um, do people who got access to Coffee County, Georgia elections equipment hope to accomplish by copying the drivers? If you if you know, or can speculate. Um, and I wish I could just ask if you an answer to that because that might be the best way. <laughs> Um, I would just say that a lot of the things that took place in the wake of the 2020 elections of that flavor of trying to get a hold of elections technology um, to analyze, inspect, reverse engineer, um, a lot of that came from a biased perspective. We didn't really acknowledge the, the val uh, validation of that technology before it was used. There's rigorous processes in place to decide what technology gets to be involved in U.S. elections. And I think um, if we seek to, to work that backwards, um, there's a lot of danger there uh, to doing a lot of rigor that's built into the front end. So I would just say that. I'm not exactly sure what that case was designed to do. But I promise you it was not mindful of what went into enabling that technology to be used in the election on the front end. And one final question, unless anyone out there wants to add another one to the mix. This maybe is important for all of us. What can an individual do to protect themselves from a deep fake um, or to react if they are involved in some way? No one has that answer yet, right? This is kind of new stuff, um, but but communicating openly, honestly, frequently about things seems to be the best path that anyone has devised yet. So if you are uh, concerned about yourself being uh, involved in a deep fake or have reason to believe you have, you need to, to get ahead of that as quickly as you can. So there's a public aspect of this, public figures, public leaders. There's also kind of a fraud storyline you may have heard of like, people generating voice snippets of the grandson that's going to jail in Mexico if grandma and grandpa don't send them money. And it sounds just like those things are out there as well. Um, so think about those cases. How would you contact the grandson? Uh, would you be really the one they would call? Um, is there someone else you could validate their story with before you send that money? Um, and, and really just taking the time to sort of uh, breathe, analyze, assess, and not quickly react by passing your bank account number to that grandson phone you know so those are the common sense steps in that more realistic everyday kind of fraud example for anyone that's concerned publicly i think it's about um, having the mechanisms in place to deliver accurate information quickly when there's reason to counter miss or disinformation we do have a little time if there's anyone who has a question out there just raise your hand and i'll repeat it into the system All right, we do have an online question. What kind of privacy issues are there in particular for students in using AI? In other words, giving information to AI generators. In general, if you look at some of the terms and conditions of some of these tools. I mentioned earlier, they say things like, we will have access to all of your emails. We will have access to all of your contacts and contact information if you sign up for this tool. So there's just general being a person risks. Um, as far as students go, if you've ever heard of the HERPA policy, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, students from for example, uh, if they have a family member who doesn't want to go to college and study theater, which I deal with sometimes, and the student doesn't want the parents to know that that's what they're doing in college. And all of a sudden, if their privacy of their class enrollment and interactions with their teacher somehow gets revealed, the parents could find out, they could be in trouble. I mean, this is a, kind of a weird case, but those kinds of things like it could be violating their federally protected rights to be a college student and to be in whatever classes they want to be in and have the grades that they have i mean you hear politicians all the time they say you know what, what grades did you get in high school 
or a college or whatever. And that's actually federally protected information, but it could get out there if, if the terms are violated. So those are the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, one other thing I'll mention is that if a student um, turns in an assignment, for example, like a paper that they wrote, maybe it's a very private uh, story about the family history, maybe the creative writing class where they wrote something personal. Um, if the teacher suspects that that was written by a generative AI tool, the teacher takes that text and puts it out on the internet to do a detection of some kind, because there's lots of AI tools that can predict whether it was actually created by AI. So AI catching AI. <laughs> All of a sudden, that teacher has just given that student's work to the internet, which could get out there somewhere. And this has happened. Um, and students could sue, you know. So their, their private information could go the other way. The teacher might actually accidentally, not on purpose, violate their rights. So there's a lot of a lot of layers to that. Any other things that you can think of? Yeah. So the question is, are there safe ways to use AI? If you're going to use it, what are the safeguards that you should consider? Not all tools are going to do that. Just read the conditions, you know. Um, some of them won't do that. Just be very careful. Um, and, you know, we tell people create a different email address. So, me, when I want to use an AI tool, I have a Gmail account that I do not use for anything else. No contacts in it. I don't put anything in those emails. I don't use that email for anything personal. So, that would be my recommendation. If any of you want to experiment with AI tools, yourself another free gmail account that's not attached to anything else and use that instead to sign up for the tool so that's one recommendation i have but some tools are going to be better about it than others not all no some of them will but some of them won't so be careful yeah yeah any other questions All right. Well, um, it takes a whole lot of people to put on an event like this. So first, let's start by thanking our amazing speaker, Kathleen Marcus and Bill. Um, a huge shout out to our ASL interpreters, Michelle and AJ, who have done an amazing job. Thank you so much. Uh, you haven't seen her, but behind the scenes, we have a Zoom moderator, Barbara Barony, who's been helping out and keeping everything going online. Of course, thanks to Rita and to Carol for their support. Our thanks to Ramsey County um, Library and Roseville for their partnership in this. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Rita. She has a few closing remarks and some um, announcements to make. Thank you, Carrie. And I think we, uh, Gary Dixon deserves a huge thank you. I... This topic was obviously percolating in her brain in late 2022. And we just happened to be sitting next to each other at a um, memorial luncheon. And Carrie, you know, I kind of into the situation we were in and she said something about, I've got an idea for a, an, a League of Women Voters program. And she mentioned artificial intelligence. So my head was just in something. And I said, we're the League of Women Voters. I mean, AI, come on. <laughs> you know? But then the more I thought about it, and then we met, I think we met again in February and March. Um, we said, well, yeah, AI has everything to do with League. You know, it, it, we cannot avoid it. And so I really, really appreciate her for tackling um, before we leave or wrap up, I'd like you to, um, on behalf of the league, either take out your phone calendars or grab one of these bright yellow little bookmarks, which Carol Marshall has in the back. 
because it has a number of events, let's see, through December. We didn't go into January yet. Beginning this Thursday, um, the uh, Falcon Heights Mayoral and City Council Candidate Forum will be held at, or at Falcon Heights City Hall, 7 to 8 o'clock. And again, if you're not familiar with League, League does sponsor these candidate forums um, throughout the area, throughout the state, throughout the country. Then September 28th, and because I'm guessing most of us are Roseville residents, or the Roseville area, I should say, residents, the Roseville School District ISD 623 candidate, school board candidate forum will be held just down the road at the Petra Education Center. That's a Thursday night from 7 to 8.30, and we really believe this is going to be a very important forum. And moving ahead to October 26th, that's a Thursday night, please mark your calendars, because we will be, the, our league will be hosting conversations with constituents where at Roseville City Hall, where at, starting at six o'clock, whereby uh, five mayors, three county commissioners, and eight legislators have been invited. And we're gonna mix up that uh, format a little bit. It's gonna be a little bit different this year. And um, this is a great opportunity to meet and ask questions to select officials. And I've kind of forewarned Chris Olson, Margot Bach, who are heading this up, that um, be prepared because there are a number of questions from mayors and commissioners, legislators, legislators this year. This could be a very interesting evening, October 26th. And then back here again, Bill Eckblad, our speaker tonight, will be here with uh, fair and secure elections behind the scenes navigation, getting into specifics, um, state's role in navigating, navigating uh, the election process. I heard this presentation in St. Paul, I believe it was before the 2020 election, and was intrigued. I just, it was kind of a similar to perhaps what he presents to counties, officials. Right. With, with the AI elements added into it. So I, I anticipate that to be a very interesting evening. And uh, Carrie mentioned the uh, Ramsey County Library AI class on uh, November 27th. I'm just going to warn you, I took that July, I think it was July 20th when it was held here at Roseville. Very interesting class because it got into mostly uh, chat GPT and other creative AI unleashed. It got into specifics where the presenters guided us in using it. We could be on our phones and create our own uh, chat GPT um, account, etc. It turned out to be very interesting. What I learned afterwards is that class filled up. Registration is required, by the way very quickly. And I think the best way it would be just to go um, as soon as it's online on the Ramsey County site to uh, register for that if you do so. I hate to be um, greedy about it, but I, I know I personally want to take it. <laughs> it was very, very interesting. And I maybe I'll just put a caveat in there that, you know, if there are too many people, then I don't need to be included with that. And as always, check out our league website. The QR code is posted a couple places in the back for the programming details. And as I said earlier, the membership bar and the voter services bar are open for business. If you have questions, they have a, a lot of information. But we want to thank you profusely for attending tonight and um, to um, pursue, look into, uh, some of the other events with League of Women Voters, Do Good Roseville, and the Ramsey County Library. And we have somebody, Kathy is here from Do Good Roseville, that could perhaps ask, answer a few questions too. Thank you so much for attending this evening.